Well, hello, and thanks for joining us for another service of worship of the Church of the Resurrection here on Res TV. I'm Dan Clare, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Church of the Resurrection. So glad that you've tuned in to worship with us. And today we are celebrating the Ascension of Jesus. Last Thursday was the Feast of the Ascension. Today is the Sunday after the Ascension, the day when we usually gather together and worship the risen and ascended Lord Jesus. It's such good news. Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. And the scriptures tell us all about this wonderful day when Jesus takes his seat upon the throne and when he begins to pour out gifts upon his people, his people whom he has raised also from death to new life. And so we gather together to celebrate and worship him and to anticipate the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful time, a wonderful season, and we're going to really celebrate together today. I want to invite you to prepare your hearts to meet with our King, Jesus, in worship now. Just take a moment to pause before him and prepare, and then Please stand and we'll worship together. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. And now let's pray the collect for purity together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord, amen. Let's lift praises to our ascended King. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing his power and his love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. Chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. From the hills it descends to the plain And sweetly distills in the dew and the rain Frail children of dust and feeble as frail In thee do we trust nor find thee to fail Thy mercies how tender, how firm to the end Our maker, defender, redeemer and friend Our Lord Jesus loves to hear our confession of sin and to grant us forgiveness by his grace. And so here now, a summary of the law. What Jesus said was this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now, let's kneel together as you're able and let us humbly confess our sins before Almighty God.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now stand and let's sing together praises for our Lord. And as you stand, hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you don't build it with labor in vain, without your spirit, we stand with no strength. I know my of your hands of what will remain let the favor of for about two months now. Please join me in praying the collect for children. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
Heavenly Father, you have blessed our congregation with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom as we bring them up in the faith that they might never know a day apart from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Alleluia! The Lord is risen. We are in Eastertide, a time of great celebration. God has raised Jesus from the dead, and through Jesus, God is making all things new. We celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus during Eastertide, and it is such a great celebration that we celebrate for seven whole Sundays, seven weeks after Easter, all the way until Pentecost. This time is full of feasting and looking at the world around us and seeing all the ways that God is bringing new life to our world. But we are nearing the end of this special Easter season and Jesus is preparing to go back to heaven, to take his rightful place with God the Father as King Now, when Jesus was on earth, the religious leaders and the Roman rulers did not greet Jesus as king. Instead, they gave him a different kind of crown, a crown of thorns. But this did not stop Jesus' plan. Even though Jesus was put to death on the cross, he rose victoriously three days later after fighting the greatest battle there ever was. He defeated Satan. He put to death sin. And he vanquished death for us forever. He set us free. And after Jesus rose from the dead, he took his place as our victorious king. And he walked and he talked with his disciples. And he prepared his disciples for 40 days. And during that time, he was telling them, get ready, the story is not over. I have great plans for you. But wait, I will bring you the Holy Spirit of God. You see, Jesus was not an ordinary king. He, was, he wasn't the type of king that people expected. He rose from the dead, and his disciples, they wondered, was Jesus going to take his throne on earth or in heaven? Let's make our hearts quiet and hear. Get ready to hear from God's good words to us today. After Jesus died on the cross and God raised Jesus to new life, Jesus appeared to his disciples many times. He appeared to Mary by the tomb. He appeared to Thomas and the disciples when they were locked up in the upper room. He appeared to the disciples and Peter by the sea. He appeared to the men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus appeared many times over and over to show that he was truly risen from the dead. And for 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples and explained the scriptures to them. He explained what his life and de death and resurrection meant. He told them about the kingdom of God. And he gave his disciples special instructions. He told them, wait for what the Father promised. The promises that you have heard from me. You remember John the Baptist. He baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And soon. Jesus explained to the disciples that it was time for Jesus to go home to his father and take his rightful place as king on the throne in heaven. But the disciples, they were worried they remembered what Jesus had told them before that he died. He had promised them that there is a place for you, and I am going to go ahead and get it ready. 
So the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, is now the time that you, re you will restore your kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, You don't need to know the time of those events that only the Father knows. But the Holy Spirit will come and give you power, and you will be able to tell everyone about me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and everywhere in the whole world. And then, after Jesus said this, something amazing happened. Jesus rose up into the air, higher and higher, and he was taken up into a cloud. They could not see him, but as he went up, they kept looking to the sky. Suddenly, as they were looking up, two men, dressed in white cloths, appeared and were standing there beside them. And they said to the disciples, What are you men of Galilee standing here looking up at the sky for? Jesus has been taken to heaven, and he will come back the same way you saw him leave. This is why when we worship God, each week we rejoice together saying, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Let's wonder about this story. The story of Jesus ascending to his place as king in heaven together. I wonder what was it like for the disciples to be with Jesus after his death and resurrection for many days, to walk with him and to talk with them, to eat with him and to learn from him. How do you think they remember this special time? I wonder how the disciples felt when they looked and watched Jesus ascend to heaven. What do you think they said to one another? Do you think that they were sad that they couldn't see Jesus anymore, or touch him, or ask him a question, or hear an answer with their ears from his voice. Do you ever feel sad that you can't see Jesus with your eyes, or touch him, or hear his voice with your ears? Last week, we learned that Jesus promised his disciples that he would never leave them, that he would be with them forever. Do you think that after Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples wondered how Jesus could leave and be with them at the same time? Even though Jesus isn't with us, in the same way we can rejoice because he's in heaven on his throne, holding all things together where he rules and reigns as king. What kind of king do you think that Jesus is? What do you think his kingdom is like? I wonder how the disciples felt when they saw the angels tell them that Jesus would return one day. I wonder, is there anything in our world that you want Jesus to come as king and make right again? Is there anything sad or broken in your heart that you want Jesus to make new? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for sending us your only son, the King of Kings, to live a life of perfect obedience to you and to defeat Satan and sin and death forever. Re we rejoice that you are seated on your throne, reigning over all things. And we thank you that you have promised us the gift of your Holy Spirit so that you can be with us even when we can't see you. We can't wait for you to return to earth and make all things new. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please join us in praying the Collect of the Day. 
O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Our first lesson today is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 47. Please read along with me. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued people under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alex. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Galatians 3, verses 10 through 22. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? 
It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hello once again. My name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors here at Church of the Resurrection. It's great to be with you today here on Res TV. We've been going through the book of Galatians over the past few weeks, and we're about halfway through it now. I, I trust it's been a blessing for you and an encouragement in the same way that it has been for me and for pastors Dan and Somane. And in our journey through the book of Galatians so far, uh, today we've come to a passage in Galatians that we just heard read, Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 22. And it's frankly a pretty difficult passage to interpret. One New Testament scholar called it a maze of labored exegesis, puzzling illustration, and cryptic theological shorthand. Now, if that doesn't get you excited to listen to a sermon about this passage, uh, I, I don't know what will. It's a pretty advanced Bible passage, it's true. But here's the thing that I want you to understand as we dig into this, this passage in Galatians chapter 3. If we can unlock the basic meaning of this passage, uh, we have then unlocked a deeper understanding of the whole Bible. That's right. Uh, if we can unlock the meaning of this passage in Galatians 3, we then can have a deeper understanding of the whole Bible. You know, a lot of, today, a lot of people today, e even Christians, uh, feel that the Bible is this tangled mess. A and there's a lot of it that they're not sure what to do with. You know, they might not always say it, but, but they feel like maybe the Bible is, is incoherent, or maybe it's irrelevant, or uh, m maybe some of it is, is not even all that helpful, that it's, that it's in fact harmful. And this is especially true as it comes to reading the Old Testament, or what, what we sometimes call the law, or the laws of the Old Testament. And uh, it's not just Christians today, though, who have this problem of feeling this way about the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. Uh, in Galatians, this book that we've been reading, Paul is writing to a mostly Gentile church, uh, a mostly Gentile group of people who want to understand and apply the Bible to their lives, but they are confused as, how they should, as to how to do so. Some false teachers have come in and said that faith in Jesus is, is important, it's necessary, but that it's not quite enough to be accepted before God. And so they're grappling with this. Uh, and, and it's not just an academic debate that the Galatian Christians are um, engaging in here, that Paul's engaging with. We are talking about how one is made acceptable before God. And so Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians to bring clarity. He wants to show that the story of the Bible is coherent, that it's relevant and that it is truly good news from start to finish and that effort what he's doing in the whole book it all comes together in some ways in this passage galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 22. so i mentioned how complicated this text can be and that's true there's a lot here but i'm going to try to make this somewhat simple you see, what Paul is doing is giving us a framework for understanding the Bible in terms of two basic categories, the promise, or the gospel, and the law. The promise, gospel, and the law. I'll call them gospel and law. And, and we need to understand what each of these is and how they relate to one another in Scripture. And so what we're going to do, again, very simple, is we're going to look at what is the gospel, according to Paul, what is this promise? What is the law? And then how do these two things relate to one another? Now before we get into it, let me pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of the Father, 
of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, what is the gospel? The gospel, Paul says, the promise is God's unconditioned work on our behalf. The gospel is the establishment of God's gracious rule over our lives, apart from any merit or action of our own. The gospel is not a deal, but a promise. Now, if you look at our text from verses 10 to 22, uh, Paul does not use the term the gospel here explicitly. In fact, something has happened. He, he's used that term a lot, but now he's shifted from using the term gospel, but to using the, instead to using the term the promise. And the two things, though, are, are intimately related. If you look with me at Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul writes here uh, that the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all nations be blessed. So God preached beforehand the gospel to Abraham. And what was that gospel? It's specifically the form of a promise. In other words, what we see is the gospel always has this promissory character. The gospel is preached to Abraham in the form of a promise that you will be, through your seed, will be a blessing to all nations. So the gospel has to be understood as promise. Now, what is a promise? A a promise is, is something that's unconditioned. It's an unconditioned grant. It's a statement of one, what one party will do, irrespective of what the other party will do or has done. It's, it's an unconditioned grant. The promise, in, in other words, is a true gift. And it's, it's distinguished, for, for our purposes, from, from what we might think of as a more traditional two-way contract, a, a deal, a, a quid pro quo. The gospel has the character of promise, a gift given, irrespective of the worth of the recipients. And what one must do to get it is to simply accept it. You see, to to receive a true promise, something with that gift character, all you really have to do is believe it. Imagine if I told you that uh, I wanted to give you $10,000, and all you had to do was uh, go down to the bank, show them your ID, and it would be given to you. That's a promise. I've said it's yours. Receive it. In fact, I've already given it to you technically. It's there. It's waiting for you. It's got your name on it. But the only way that you're going to get it is if you believe and take hold of it. Just take hold of it. Just believe enough to go ask for it. There are no other conditions that you have to meet. And the story of the Bible, the story of salvation history, which begins in earnest with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, is all about this sort of promise agreement. Remember back in verse 6, Paul quotes another critical verse from Genesis, Genesis 15, verse 6, where he says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. If you want to understand how the gospel has the nature of a promise agreement, It really helps to understand that verse in the context of Genesis 15. What happens there? What does it mean that Abraham believes God and it's counted to him as righteousness? It's a pivotal story. You know, in in Genesis chapter 15, God shows up and he says to Abraham, repeating the promise from Genesis 12, he shows up and he says, Abraham, I will give you a seed, descendants, a people. I will make of you a great nation. I will give you this land. And Abraham says, Abraham is is a normal guy like you or me. He says, well, how will I know that it's going to happen? Abraham's saying, okay, I I want this, God. Let's make a deal. Tell me how I can know it's mine. Where, Where do I sign up for this? What do I do? And God says, in effect, okay, you you want to make a deal, Abraham? Go get a heifer, a goat a ram, a dove, and a pigeon. And that sounds bizarre to us, but, but Abraham knows what this is about. He, they're going to cut these two, these animals, they're going to cut them in two. 
They're going to cut covenant. They're going to cut all these animals in half and walk between the pieces, each stating their responsibilities to the other. They're making a deal. They're saying, if I don't do what I say, if I don't hold up my end of the agreement, then let me be just like this animal, cut off. Even if I have to be killed and cut in half like these animals to do it, I will keep my end of the bargain. Abraham and God are going to make a deal. Well, that's what Abraham thinks. And so Abraham gets the contract ready. He, he cuts the animals up. He lines them up. They're gonna, he's ready to make a deal. But what happens? He gets it ready, and, and as he waits for God, this dreadful darkness comes down upon him. He falls into a, a deep sleep or, or some sort of trance. And then all of a sudden, he wakes up to see some sort of fiery thing hovering in midair, passing between the pieces of the animals. And he hears the voice of God stating the promise, I will give you a seed, descendants, this land. And that's it. Abraham doesn't have to pass through the pieces at all. This is astounding. This is astounding. This is not how a covenant works. This is not how a contract works. This is not how you make a deal. You see, in those days, if, if a king conquered another king, they would make a treaty. The losing king would surrender, and he'd have to agree to the terms set by the victorious king. He might get some protections in return, so, but he'd have to pledge his fealty, and, 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 and so they'd both make this agreement. And they'd pass through the pieces. But here, God, the king, passes through the pieces with a promise and doesn't require Abraham to pass through it all. It's astounding. In other words, God is making a promise that what he is going to do, this blessing, is going to come about entirely through God's power and not at all through Abraham's abilities. God is on the hook to do it. He's saying, even if I have to be killed to follow through on this blessing, I will do. I will do it. What does Abraham have to do? Just believe. Just receive this promised blessing. That's what Paul's getting at when he talks about the gospel when he talks about the promise, when he talks about faith. Do you understand God like that? Do you understand that acceptance before God is something you, you just receive apart from and in spite of yourself? That there's a God who loves you, who accepts you, who wants to bless you just because he is good. And all you have to do is believe. It isn't even that your faith has to be particularly strong. Faith isn't really what saves or justifies you. Faith is, is, what faith is only as strong as the object it's in. Faith is, is itself just an opening of the hand to receive the gift. Faith is a sort of passivity, of receptivity of what God has done and will do. You know, we often say around here, uh, rightly so, that the gospel is a euangelion, the announcement of the arrival of a king. The gospel is the announcement of the arrival of a king. You see what that means? The gospel is the announcement of something factual. It's already happened. It's already happening. The true king, his gracious rule, his acceptance of you. And the way we enter into that joy is by faith, by welcoming, accepting, giving thanks for this king and the blessing he brings. So Paul is here throughout this passage talking about promise. He's contrasting promise with law. Promise is, is closely related to the word gospel. The gospel is God's unconditioned work on our behalf. It's a promise. It's not a deal. But... Here's the second thing I want you to see. There is a contrast here. Paul does speak of the law. So what is the law? 
when you look at it, the, the law is clearly a sort of two-way agreement. It's a deal that places requirements on both parties. The law gives conditions that must be met in order to achieve blessedness. The law says, do these things and be blessed, or don't do them and be cursed. Look at verse 10 with me. Paul says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 27, 26. In Deuteronomy 27, the people of Israel were given a ceremony where they were to renew their, their covenant with God, their deal with God. Each year, the people were to be divided up into two. One, one side of the, one half of the people would go line up near Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessings. And the other half would line up along Mount Ebal, the Mount of Curses. And then the Levites, the priests, uh, they would pronounce all the, the law to them and they would pronounce blessings for, belief, for, for obedience and they would pronounce curses for disobedience. And this verse, this, this verse that Paul quotes here is, is the end of that where, where they say, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. What was probably true is that this verse was loved by the false teachers, the Judaizers. They loved to use this verse to point out that you've got to do this law or else you're cursed. If you aren't circumcised, you will be cursed. Maybe if you don't keep the dietary commandments, you'll be cursed. Of course, if you don't keep the Ten Commandments, you will be cursed. So the Judaizers would have quoted this verse to make their point. Well, Paul needs to, to deal with that. He, he really does. And what does Paul have to say to this? Well, first, I, I want you to, to take note of, briefly, what Paul does not say in this passage. What he is not saying in this complicated passage. What he does not say is what so many Christians today seem to think. And what they seem to think is, oh, well, that's just the Old Testament. And now we're in the New Testament. Out with the old, in with the new. Paul doesn't say that at all. Paul will not say that God talks out of both sides of his mouth. He won't say anything like that. He, he knows that God's words and his works must be consistent. So what Paul says instead in verses 10 through 14 is that the blessings and the curses of the law are real. God means those promised blessings. He means those corresponding curses. When the law comes to the Jewish people, it really is binding on them. They have to, in a real sense, live by it. It provides them with a path to blessing, and it threatens curses. The one who does them shall live by them, Paul says, quoting another passage. However, the reality, the reality that Paul is pointing out is that no one can be accepted before God. No one can experience blessedness from God by observance of the law. How do we know? Paul quotes Habakkuk, Chapter 2, verse 4, quotes other places in Scripture that every time we see that someone is justified or accepted by God, it is on the basis of faith. And what Paul says also is that we know that no one gets blessedness through the law because the law doesn't just demand some little surgery on your genitals. It demands wholehearted total devotion, if you don't do all that is in it, you will be cursed. So the law is real. It is binding. It is God's word. But Paul says, if it is what we live by, what we live under, the ultimate thing that we live under, then it can only bring curses. Because no one can do it perfectly, truly, or consistently. So the law is a sort of two-way agreement. Requirements for both parties. It's real. So gospel is promise. Law is 
this two-way agreement. And there's a real tension. This is the kind of how do these things relate together, the the final bringing this, this together. There's a real tension within the pages of Scripture, within the pages of the Old Testament itself, Paul is saying. On the one hand, Uh, We see from the beginning, the very beginning of the story, this promise, this gospel that the blessing comes through faith. Unconditioned, unilateral action of God. Then on the other end, we see the law that says that that blessing requires observance, the fulfillment of requirements, and, and that failure to do so brings cursing. Now, what does Paul do with this tension? Again, he doesn't say that one part of it's true and the other is false, or one is new and the other is old, and one is obsolete and the other is is, uh, relevant. Look at what Paul says in verses 20 and 21. At the end of verse 20, he says, but God is one. But God is one. Now, it's complicated what he's doing earlier in that verse, but it it seems clear that by saying God is one, what Paul is saying is, is that the gospel and the law which both come from God, cannot ultimately contradict each other. God doesn't contradict himself. He is one. And that's why Paul says in the next verse, verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Meganoite. Certainly not. Absolutely not. So the two things must not be in contradiction. They must be reconcilable. How so, though? How so? You know, the Judaizers, they were saying something like this, that that the promise of the gospel begins a relationship with God. It begins. It's the start. It's it's the seed. But then it comes to fulfillment and completion in the observance of the law. And Paul says, this makes no sense. This is like saying that the goal of, of the gospel is to deliver you to the law which you cannot perform, to deliver you to a place of futility. Paul says this makes no sense. The story doesn't make any sense. Paul's version instead, so if that's how they read it, the the gospel's the beginning and it goes and it comes to its end in the law. Notice that Paul says there's the beginning, the the pre-gospel, the gospel preached beforehand to Abraham, The gospel that comes in Christ and both show us righteousness that comes, acceptance with God that comes by faith, 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 from faith to faith. That they're the same thing in substance. One's the shadow, one's the fulfillment. And the question then, so if if Paul's way of reading the story is from faith to faith, not from faith ending in the goal of the law, but from faith to faith from relationship with God that is more personal to relationship, then the question becomes, as Paul asks in verse, here, uh, verse 19, why then the law? So if Paul says faith to faith, why is the law here in the middle? How does it relate to the gospel, to the promise? And Paul says a few things. I would love to here spend some time and go into a lot of depth about the three uses of the law in in traditional uh, Christian teaching, especially reform teaching, which are very good. But let me just kind of say a few things briefly. Why? Well, Paul says first, because of transgressions. The law comes to teach us of sin because of transgressions, verse 19. The law, the moral law and its requirements serve to reveal sin to us. The law doesn't merely tell us that that X action is sin. It does that. But it also shows us by our inability to live up to, by the way that we rebel against it, that the problem of sin goes way deeper than our actions. That the problem of sin is something radically wrong with us. A sickness unto death, as Soren Kierkegaard says. So it teaches us of sin. You know, um, there's, a, there's a sense in which our hearts can deceive us. Part of the deceptiveness of sin is that we can call something good, which is not itself good. That we can think that something is fine when it, in fact, is sin. And, and by making his will known in a concrete form of a law, God has uh, 
has given us one more way to, to hear objectively what sin is and not, not to be as easily self-deceived. The law reveals sin. The second thing the law does is it teaches us of the Savior, to point us to the Savior, to teach us of, our, of who he is. In verses 10 through 12, uh, Paul makes the point that the law can only bring curses while the blessing, the blessing comes through faith. But notice how he ends. He says in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He says, look, if you are under the law, you are only cursed by it. But the law points away from itself. The law itself actually teaches its own insufficiency and points you to Jesus. That's the point Paul's making. And you can see this throughout the law in the way that the law itself, what is a huge part of it, is this whole apparatus for sacrifice. The law has built into it the fact that no one can do it and that they therefore need sacrifice and atonement and forgiveness. So the law, Paul says, it, it, it presumes its own insufficiency and points us to believe in the one who will bear the curse on our behalf. So it teaches us of the Savior. It teaches us of our sin. It teaches us of the Savior. And here's the, the third thing I'll say about what the law, why then the law, is it's to be a guide, to be a guide in our Christian lives. Now, Paul doesn't explicitly say this, say something like that in this passage. It might even sound contradictory with, with how negative he seems about the law to think that he would see the law as a helpful guide to life. But he does hint towards something in verse 14. The coming of the Spirit. The coming of the Spirit. You see, Paul's going to teach us, and he is teaching us in Galatians, that we aren't under the law. That we aren't under the law. You see, for the Jewish people, when the law came, before Christ came, they were under the law. In effect, they only knew of the promise through the law. They could only grasp the promise of God through the mediation of the law. They were under it. But when the promise comes in Christ and the sending of the Holy Spirit and the fulfillment of the faith of Abraham that was before the law, they are no longer under it meaning they're no longer slavishly bound to it. They, they, they must only see uh, Jesus through the, the guise of the, through the lens of the law. Instead, they can now read and interpret the law from a higher vantage point. They're not under the law, but yet they still can, they can read the law from a higher vantage point of being in the spirit, of being with Christ, in Christ. In a sense, Christians as those who are in Christ occupy a place above the law. They can see it as it really is in light of Jesus. And so Christianity, as it, as it develops, there's never, ever, the ch Christian church has never accepted a throwing out of the Old Testament law. There was, there was a pastor a couple of years ago who said, we need to unhitch uh, ourselves from the Old Testament. Meaning, you know, laws, the, this old, and no, that was never accepted. Marcionitism was, was a heresy that you could sort of say, oh, the, the things going on in the Old Testament were, were not good and don't have a purpose. No, we don't ever disregard the law. But we are not under it. And so Christianity, both in the pages of the New Testament, develops a very nuanced reading of the law. Parts of it are ceremonial, and they teach us much, but they're not literally binding on us anymore. Circumcision, food laws, they reveal things to us about God's holiness. They point us to Christ in all sorts of ways. We can see, we can make that distinction by what the apostles do in light of Christ. And then other parts of the law become intensified, actually, that, that we see them for how deep they really are. You think of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, 
He says, well, you, you know, you think adultery is just sleeping with another man's wife. Well, adultery, that, that command goes way deeper than that. It's about the heart. And so these command, the law speaks to a righteousness which we are to aspire, but only by asking the Spirit's help. We're not under it. It teaches us. It instructs us but only as we are in the Spirit, in Christ. And the law can also, you know, filtered through Christ, teach us much about the ordering of our lives together. So when you, only when you put the law, the, the point here is, is you can't say the gospel serves the law. You can't put the, you, you can't put the law inside the gospel, the, the law, or the, the, sorry, the gospel inside the law with the law as the goal. Instead, you have to situate the law firmly inside of the gospel so that you are not under it, but over it. That it's from faith to faith. Only then does the law become a, a tool within your life rather than simply an instrument that pronounces death. So here we are, the gospel and the law. This is a very classic distinction, very complicated. It's a dense passage that we're in, and I've tried to just pick out a few things and kind of make it through. And there's been a lot of explanation here um, and not a lot of bringing it down into our lives. And, and in that sense, um, this is bad homiletics. But I'll say one very quick thing. How does this proper understanding of gospel and situating the, the, prom, situating the demands which are there Inside of the promise, how does this change our lives? Knowing that we are justified entirely by faith, apart from anything we do. How do and then yet, situating the, the demands, the law inside of that. How does that change us? Well, I think Eugene Peterson gets at this really well in a, a bunch of sermons he wrote on Galatians in, in the 1980s. He says, this means you can be free to fail. You can be free to fail. What does he mean? What he means is the fact that we are already accepted in Christ allows us to come to God's word, earnestly seeking to obey, earnestly desiring to be holy. The Spirit awakens us to want to be like Jesus, to want to be holy, and we can seek after that without any fear of failing. We can be free to fail. Because our justification does not depend on our performance. It's knowing that we are accepted and loved that actually inspires and motivates a desire for holiness. If you haven't experienced this in your life, focus and meditate on this fact that God has accepted and loves you and receives you, that you are justified apart from anything you do. If you really understand that, not in a kind of abstract way, but in a way of, of being loved and entering into his presence, you will find that it changes you, that you have a growing desire for holiness. And you'll want to do those portions of the Bible that God calls us to you'll do it in dependence on him because it's from faith to faith all the way through. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fountain, no, nothing but the blood of and Dan Bruner, and we live in the historic Anacostia neighborhood. We've been attending Res for six years and about nine years. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our Archbishop and our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, for all in public service, especially our President Joe Biden, our Mayor Muriel Bowser, and Governors Larry Hogan of Maryland and Ralph Northam of Virginia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We know, we, I now invite you to add your own petitions at home. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you and the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as Christ our Savior has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father, Amen. who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hi, my name is Mikkel. I live in Eastern Market, and I've been attending Res for a few months. Please join me in making a confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Send greetings of peace to those near and far. Send greetings to friends from Church of the Resurrection you haven't seen in a while, to loved ones. Um, and send out the peace of Christ as you're able. As you do, let me share some things that are happening in the life of our church very briefly. We're regathering for worship here in this space, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and Sunday evenings at 5 p.m. We hope that you'll come and join us as we have room now for you. Uh, please come, there are refreshments after our services and we really look forward to getting to see you in person soon. On May the 23rd, especially, that will be a very important day for us. It's the Feast of Pentecost. It will be a great celebration of worship together. And also, from 3 to 5 p.m. in the side yard here at 501 East Street on Capitol Hill, we'll be saying farewell to the Wilcoxon family as Matt and Annie and their children go to Sydney, Australia for a new ministry that Matt will be leading there. We're so excited to send them off. We're so excited for this new calling. Uh, we're also so sad to see them go. And so come and celebrate them with us and uh, let's send them off well, 3 p.m. on Sunday, May 23rd. There are a lot of uh, upcoming events and activities in the life of the church this summer. We're relaunching our small group ministry called Res Groups. We would love for you to be a part of one of those. Those will be meeting throughout the summer starting the first week of June. We'll also have some courses, our beta groups, and if you're in touch with us through our newsletter and our listserv, 
you can find out more about those. An important class that's offered on Wednesday nights at 7 this summer is our Foundations course. It's a way for you to find out more about the beliefs and practices of our church. If you would like to be a part of that, you can sign up through our website. It starts on Wednesday, June 2nd, here at the building at 7 p.m. There are lots of other activities for you to be a part of, and you can find out about them on our website. Just go to reschurch.org. Finally, we encourage you to give generously to the ministry of the Church of the Resurrection. Your financial gifts are of tremendous help to us. Thank you for your generosity in the past, and please do continue to give as we need your support for this work and for this building that we're renovating and for our benevolence ministries to people here, uh, both inside the church and around the city. Thank you for giving to the Lord. And now we're going to sing another song together and then I'll be back to say farewell. Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. Now receive the benediction. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes we set on the risen Christ. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this week and forever. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Come worship the King. Oh, glory.